Good afternoon and welcome to Sector Spotlight. I'm Namdi Obukhalu, analyst on the restaurants and, 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 and consumer staples team. I'm joined by our associate, uh, Shane Laidlaw, uh, going through a few of our names today. Um, as always, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat stream and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Shane, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much, Nandi, and thanks everyone for joining us today. As Nandi said, we'll be touching on quite a few names here, going pretty high level on them, so if you want anything more specific, please uh, get it in the queue and we'll do our best to get to it at the end. So turning to slide four, we'll just run you through a couple of our best ideas list here, but first on staples, the top long we have currently right now is Red Robin, small cap restaurant name. Although it's kind of stuck in the silo of casual dining, we think it has uh, some great runway for growth driven by a new management team that has a lot of industry experience and they're coming together to really bring uh, this brand from the depths and bring it to where it really can be and thriving. I think one of the highlights of, of the long there is being able to bring their to-go business from 5% to a more industry average number around 10% from the top names such as Olive Garden. And then on the best ideas list as a short, which we'll be talking about in a few moments more in depth, uh, Chipotle remains our best idea there. And, uh, we think up at these elevated levels, it makes for a decent opportunity. Um, moving to slide five, we'll talk about our, a couple staples names at the end of this presentation, but just to highlight, uh, best idea currently Whole Foods. Uh, Jana has obviously taken a big stake in that. Some shareholders start, are starting to make some noise, pushing management to, uh, to go for the possible M&A route. Uh, we still think fundamentally they can turn the business around, but now you have multiple ways to win there, which is good. And then on the short side, UNFI has been a kind of it's been knocked down because of what Jana said. They said that they could possibly re rework or get rid of the UNIFI contract with uh, Whole Foods, which would be very detrimental to that business. But although we think it will probably play out a little differently than that, longer term, that business has still struggled. And then Hain is uh, still no financials for almost a year now, so we don't really know what to tell you on that, although <laughs> we doubt it's good. Um, so then let's get into some names here. First on restaurants, we'll get into our best idea long McDonald's. It's the most recent addition to our best ideas list as a long, which we, which we put back up uh, about a week ago now. We originally went long back in 2015, kind of timing around the 3Q15 time period, wrote it for about a year and then started to see, um, see management start to think about the business possibly going into too much coffee. And we, start, we pulled back our confidence in it to some extent, but we reunited said confidence uh, last week when we launched it on the long, long side. So turning to slide seven, we'll take a look at the, the same store sales comp for the United States. We kind of broke it out in before all day breakfast and all day breakfast and after all day breakfast. All day breakfast was kind of, it was really the igni ignition switch here that was turned on to really reignite the business uh, and really drive them forward. It was driving consumers back in and now they have the opportunity, McDonald's has the opportunity to really impress the new consumers that are coming in because of all day breakfast. This is going to be experience of the future, new technology, uh, delivery in certain markets and growing faster and newer things that we'll talk about more extensively such as fresh beef and their quarter pounders which are coming soon. Turning to slide eight, we really, they've been harping on the modern pro progressive Burger King slogan for a while now and we're really starting to see that come to fruition. You, you look at other markets such as Australia, the UK, France, and they're really adopting technology. Australia is far along in experience of the future and they're seeing really strong results. There's a few units or a few hundred units that have, have started to develop this technology in the United States, but the broad kind of consumer base in the United States really hasn't come to learn, at, learn of McDonald's as this technology focused company that's really trying to improve their offering. And that's what they're doing. So as that continues to roll in the United States, I think you're really going to start to see the tide turn for the uh, consumer perception of McDonald's. Uh, turning to slide nine, as we mentioned briefly at the front, McDonald's announced that they're going to be doing fresh beef in their quarter pounder starting in 2018. I think this this initiative can't be underestimated. When a company this large with this many units starts to turn on fresh beef, it'll really allow them to better compete with, uh, with kind of the higher end fast casual bur burger companies when you think about the Shake Shacks or, or, or those of the like. It's just really going to bring them into the next kind of level of what they can offer their consumers. And it will take time for the perception to change, but with the marketing power that this company has, we think it will happen faster, faster than slower. Turning to slide 10, uh, a, a topic that we've been um, very deeply um, 
involved in as far as, as far as research goes throughout 2017 has been how delivery is changing the restaurant space and quick service is no different here. So I think obviously when you think about delivery there are different types of food that travel better. Olive Garden's having great success with pasta. Burgers are a different game, but it seems that, it seems that down in their Miami test, McDonald's seems to be having um, great success. And I think with Uber Eats involved, they're really starting to build this momentum and starting to expand their delivery initiative. So as they continue to test this, just thinking longer term, you think about markets such as Asia that, have, that are 40% of sales are through delivery. Will U.S. get to that? Probably not, because the Asia market's a little bit different, but you do have a considerable upside to what they're doing right now. And then from kind of an operational standpoint on delivery, uh, whether they do third party or, or company owned longer term, we have our thinking that kind of depending, for a large corporation such as McDonald's to depend on startups that don't really require to have a profit and may not be in the game for the long term, it's a risky play. But in the near term, as they're just testing it, we like it. Um, but I think uh, some investment in their company-owned delivery is a possibility in the future, as we've seen Bloomin hint to their own operations in delivery as well. Um, so again, quick high-level take on what we're thinking about McDonald's. So if you have any more questions on that, please feel free. But we'll turn over to slide 11 now uh, for Starbucks. So Starbucks is on our short bench currently. Um, we've kind of been on and off the short here for the last uh, better part of six months right now. Um, so turning to slide 12, we'll take a look at the consolidated comps here. So you've seen a precipitous decline starting kind of really in 1Q16 as comps have, have gotten tougher, but uh, the company really just hasn't been able to perform up to their standards, which are mid-single-digit mid comps here. So they keep on blaming, last quarter they blamed 1,200 units of, for uh, congestion due to mobile order and pay. Now that number is up to 1,800. So they're launching some tablets to try to try to remedy that. But you kind of just think about since they started mobile order and pay, it changed the loyalty program. They have a tech CEO that should be able to handle that, and now he's kind of out at the helm supposedly as the leader of this, the sole leader of this company. And technology is the one that continues to become a bigger problem. So we'll have to see how those tablets really work to to change the flow of the business for Starbucks. Turning to slide 13, we don't have to go through every data point on this stock price chart here, but um, it just kind of chronicles the events of how kind of the Starbucks price has reacted to various events, both at corporate and from a earnings perspective. I think just like to highlight uh, a few things, kind of like, it basically started to flutter once Howard announced that he was stepping away from the business full time back in July of 2016. And now you kind of just have Howard still in the business a little bit. He's supposed to be the chairman, not the CEO, but he's still having a big say in the earnings call. So it's kind of like, I don't think the company is ready to say bye to him, and I don't think he's ready to say bye to the company. I know he's still the chairman, so he's not saying goodbye, but I think. I think you're still just seeing this kind of pull of power between the two now CEO and chairman of the company. It'll be interesting to see how this dynamic evolves going forward. Uh, turning to slide 14, we'll take a look at uh, their food, uh, which the growth continues to slow here. I think we're missing a food growth number from 2Q17 because they simply didn't provide it. We'd probably assume that it slipped down into the mid single digits. Um, if it was better, they would have said it. Um, I think as they think about their food, they're starting to move towards uh, to-go uh, items, like easy that they don't have to put in their microwave ovens. They're starting to do this with the Mercado menu in Chicago. Um, when you think about how Starbucks can get to 25% of their sales from food, it's, it's going to be difficult or nearly, it's going to be very hard for them to do it, at least with warm items, just because you think about it, they don't have a kitchen. They don't have fryers, they don't have ovens, they just have these one or two microwave ovens that they have that take about a minute to a minute and a half to warm up a sandwich. So during peak hours, you're having people having to wait excessive amounts of time, which is probably leading to some of that, some of that congestion that they're experiencing at those 1800 stores. And there's just people that are just not gonna wanna deal with it, they're just gonna walk out. I mean, it, it takes a long time if you're there in peak hours and you're gonna get a frappuccino and a bacon, egg and cheese. It, it's just not worth it for a lot of people. So it's something that they really have to uh, kind of figure out. Um, so that's one of the big pinch points there we have with uh, Starbucks. Turning to our best idea short, Chipotle. Um, 
I mean, the stock is just, it's been going against us, quite frankly, I think up at 485, I think the last I checked. Um, it's trading at about 22 times forward EV to EBITDA, which we find is obviously egregious. I think when people are thinking about going along this company, they're really not thinking about kind of really what the business is doing now and what it can really truly do in the future, given how things have changed in the restaurant environment. I think although comps have turned positive here, on a, on a two-year basis, you're really not seeing a large improvement. And as you progress throughout 2017 from kind of that high teen to low teen to high single digit to low single digit, most likely, especially given the environment that we're operating in right now competitively, it's just like people aren't going to put a 22 times multiple on that. I, I just think it's egregious. And going forward, Chipotle will really be showing for, for what it's worth. And that's just like every other restaurant company. It's not worth 22 times here. So turning to slide 17, we'll delve deeper into the competitive landscape. This is obviously just a representative list, but I'll read a quick quote from the, the most recent 10K. In recent years, competition has increased significantly from restaurant formats like ours that serve higher quality food quickly and at a reasonable price. We believe that this competition has made it more challenging to maintain or increase the frequency of customer visits. So I mean, they're not oblivious to this. They know that people are copying what they're doing. I think people have seen that even Chipotle has tried to copy what they're doing. With, um, with some of their other concepts which have failed, which they've had to get out of. But when you think about what has happened over the last 18 months for Chipotle when, when their sales were down 30% in 1Q16, people just didn't stop eating. People didn't stop going to lunch. They went to try other places. And they had the opportunity to see how great these other places are and the value that they provide. I'll highlight a couple things just because just it's local. Things like Sweet Green or, or Dig In are these really high quality places that that offer a, a, a super, I would say, superior product to Chipotle, although at a slightly higher price point, I think it's definitely stealing share. And then if you think about some lower price point items, and I'll have a quote on the next slide, but like McDonald's, McDonald's doing fresh beef and their quarter pounders, you can't tell me that that's not going to affect some Chipotle uh, consumers. And then you think about Panera going private, how much more competitive can it be now that it doesn't have to worry about quarterly earnings reports? Uh, Wingstop obviously expanding aggressively. Zoe's is expanding, although their, their sales haven't been performing that well. They're still stealing shares. They grow new units. It's new trade zones. So it's, it's a lot of things happening that, I mean, these numbers of stores weren't there two years ago. So when they were doing peak volumes and peak margins in 2014 and into the early parts of 2015, they didn't have to worry about that. But times have changed. And consumer perception of Chipotle has definitely changed as well. So just turning to slide 18 where we had up previously there, uh, Mark Crompacker was quoted in the AP in September saying that people are starting to go to places like McDonald's and Chipotle knockoff. So he's admitting that what he, what Chipotle management views is an inferior product in Chipotle, in McDonald's and what they call as many other inferior products that people are going to these. So I just think people have lost favor for Chipotle and they found out what other good stuff is out there. So if you think about this chart on the left here, the CMG average unit volume chart, um, you kind of got your 2.5 peak back in the beginning parts of 2015, coming down to a low of just over 1.8. It's, we're not saying that they're never going to get back to 2.5, but it's probably not in the next three to five years. And, and if ever is still in question, I think longer term, I think uh, definitely for uh, adjusting for inflation longer term, I think 2.5 is going to be a difficult number to get to. Um, turning to slide 19 a look at uh, the restaurant level margin target, uh, a pivotal point on how they create their, uh, their net margin. Um, CMG back uh, 3Q16 earnings call, they put the kind of sell side, put some pressure on them to put a margin and uh, earnings target out there for 2017. So they most likely reluctantly put out this 20% restaurant level margin run rate by the end of 17 and $10 in EPS. Um, Although they got some profitability, it was impressive how they, they managed labor to um, improve profitability in 1Q. I think still looking longer term, you have the lower avocado prices that they were predicting is not coming to fruition. You see they were predicting roughly 100 basis points of improvement due to lower avocados. That's not going to happen this year. You have a number of other items within the restaurants that 
that are still hitting them, such as kind of increased marketing and promo, you have higher labor costs, and all these things are just going to keep compounding. And the biggest thing is kind of the sales growth, which they, uh, I think it's at 1.8% kind of contribution to them getting to that 20% restaurant level margin. And although it looks like it was improving in one Q on a two year stack, you're really just not seeing a large improvement in the business, although the trajectory is slightly upward. You just, we just have a hard time believing that it's gonna get considerably higher from here. And if you think if they're banking on kind of how this marketing, um, this marketing with in the real burrito or comedians walking to the burrito and don't even actually talk about Chipotle, they just talk about something that funny that happened in their life. I, um, I think, although we have a negative bias towards the name, I think we, we pulled a number of people and it's just, it doesn't seem to be working in our opinion. I think it just kind of misses the mark here, although it kind of takes people's mind away from Chipotle E. coli to Chipotle bad comedy. Uh, I don't think it's getting to people to want to buy Chipotle again, especially with the competitive pressures that, uh, that are around them here. And then turning to um, Buffalo Wild Wings next. This, is a, this has been an exciting one the yeah, last couple of weeks. We've yeah. been watching. It's kind of like a, a lot of back and forth. heavyweight boxing match between Mercado and uh, the Buffalo Wild Wing management team, and it's getting pretty bloody now. Um, so they've been exchanging blows over the last couple of weeks. Um, Mercado saying information's wrong in the proxy, just Buffalo Wild Wings saying it's not, going back and forth. But I think we'll just bring you back to our key points that we de definitely still ring true from our October Black Book here. So battle with the activists is escalating. We have a slide in here to talk about how kind of when activists appear to be winning, it's definitely positive for the stock price, and we think that's going to continue to uh, transpire going forward. Management's inability to lead is apparent. I think this was very apparent in the most recent quarter. Uh, history will likely repeat itself. Uh, this is a DRA case study. If anyone's interested in seeing that case study, we'd be happy to forward it to you. It's not in this deck here. And then a uh, win-win scenario on the long side. That's basically just based off. So if they are actually able to turn the fundamentals, that's positive for the stock, obviously, and Mercado goes away. But if they don't, which is what's happening now, Mercado wins, and that's positive for the stock there as well. So um, we, we still think the win-win scenario is playing out pretty well. Um, turning to slide 22, we'll take a look at Buffalo Wild Wings company-owned same-store sales. Um, obviously, this most recent quarter was saved by, the, by their heavy push of Wing Tuesdays. Um, but going back to their inability to manage the business, they pushed a business to save sales. That is the most expensive commodity that they have, which is traditional wings, which are now experiencing 8, eight to 10 percent inflation. So. Basically, to just, just to save comps, they completely destroyed margins, and that's what you see happening here. And this is what Mercado is talking about, and what we've been talking about how management just isn't in tune with the business, and they're just trying to save face to save their jobs, and that uh, doesn't appear to be working out too well for them. So turning to slide 24, due to this continued bad performance, this is a kind of stock price reaction chart with a number of events associated with Mercado and Buffalo Wild Wings management on how the stock price has reacted in said event. Um, so I think we're all looking towards June 2nd when the voting uh, takes place on the board of directors and, and we see where this, really, where this company is going next. I think thinking of looking back at the previous page on slide 22 and how poor the performance has been, I think, I think we see where the voting is most likely to go. I think people are kind of sick and tired of losing money on this stock and it's ready to kind of capture the value that this company can provide. And we still think there is great value in both the brand and the assets. They just need to be leveraged correctly. Turning to slide 24, switching, uh, switching pages over to the staples sector uh, on US foods first. So we did a black book back in January. We've been long since uh, back in November. Um, this company has a great opportunity to really kind of gain market share in a very fragmented food service distribution business. I think our top points still very much hold true here in that margin expansion through multiple avenues. We look to the strategic chain e exits that they executed through 2Q14 and 2Q17 while at the same time expanding their private brands business which is uh, went from 30% of sales to 33% of sales. And I think in addition to the kind of these two key components of it, you're also seeing them push their e-commerce capabilities, which we have a slide on in this deck and we'll talk about more extensively. Um, one of their key growth drivers is growth with independence and the healthcare segment. 
Uh, one of the reasons we love whole, uh, U.S. foods is that they, they have a very heavy focus on helping the independents and they have e-commerce capabilities that, that makes these independents uh, stickier as clients and more successful as operators as well to compete against chain restaurants. And then lastly, point three, the debt burden is improving, allowing for more M&A. You're seeing this uh, really rapidly happening uh, in the first four months. They've announced three deals with an estimated sales of $200 million, so they're off to a fast start. I think um, kind of go coming into this year, they got it to matching the number of deals from last year, which was five, so to have three done already, they're off to a fast pace and there might be some upside there potentially. Turning to slide 26, as I mentioned, their e-commerce e capabilities are one of the strongest kind of aspects of the long thesis on U.S. foods versus some of their competitors, Cisco and, and PFGC. Thinking about U.S. food specifically, though, 67% of total sales, and this is up from 52% in 20, 2011, go through their e-commerce platform, and this is compared to the last reported data point for Cisco at uh, just about 8%. And performance is, is very low-key on e-commerce. They find it that it's, it's not a top priority right now, so we're keeping our eye on how they're developing on that as well. Turn to slide 27 on M&A. Uh, on the left, uh, we'll just, that's, kind of, that's their five deals they did in 2016. Um, on the right hand side on the top you're looking at deals in the space over the last time period and then some possible bigger deals on the bottom that they could do. And then lastly but definitely not least is one of our favorite kind of M&A focused names and that's, uh, that's Pinnacle Foods. It's on our best ideas list as long. Uh, they reported results last quarter that were very good. Just, I mean they operate in some slowing categories. Uh, baking, you have kind of wishbone, you have uh, frozen bird's eye, but they're out innovating and out maneuvering the competition, which is really providing some upside for the stock. And then, I mean, you just look at this company and there's a lot of M&A potential here. They can, they can be bought, they can do some strategic M&A deals like RMTs and things like that, and the management team is really focused on creating value. So, I think with that, we'll yeah. turn to rapid fire. Let's do it. I'm excited. Yeah, it should be fun. All right, so I guess what we'll do is I'll ask a question. It's like a one word or yeah. like a quick hitter, all right? So all right, let's, let's do it. Let's bang them out. Favorite short? Chipotle. Favorite long? McDonald's. The biggest competitor for Be Wild? We talked about this like months ago, too. I like Wingstop. Wingstop? Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. Um, favorite fast casual name? To go to or for a stock name? Personal, like where, where you want to go, where you go eat, like what's your favorite? Place Zoe's is my favorite. Zoe's is favorite. All right. Um, best management team. Like a personal owner. Best management team. And feel free to pass if you don't feel comfortable. I think Conagra is one of the best out there right Conagra. now. Okay, awesome. Worst management team. Chipotle. Chipotle. Awesome. Um, so biggest earning surprise, both good and bad. The so worst was Grubhub. Yeah. I mean, we we got we admittedly got crushed on that call. Yeah. Um, I think we, we completely underestimated the effectiveness of their marketing program. Yeah, definitely. And I think longer term, the business is still challenged based on kind of the overall market dynamics of competition and yep. the commission model. But yeah, we got crossed on this one, so we moved it to the sideline and we got to wait till later. Awesome. And then yeah. upside? Yeah. In a positive way? Yeah, yeah. If you have one. I mean, I was, if we don't have one, I think. I was peasantly surprised by McDonald's. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Best fries? Wendy's. Wendy's. Best customer experience? Best customer experience, I would say it's Chick-fil-A. I know it's not public, but <laughs> it's rapid fire, I got it. They're so nice there, too. It's all They're like, so know. nice. Um, best burger in the game? Going back to Wendy's. Wendy's, okay. Um, best technology in the game? Best technology is Panera. Panera, gotcha. That was the last one. That was good. That was fun. That was really fast. <laughs> Um, okay, so moving to the general questions from the queue, uh, macro question here, the labor market's pretty tight. How big of a factor are wage increases in the restaurant? I think it's or huge. Staple space. Yeah, so you got, when you got companies saying anywhere from 4 to 6% labor yep. inflation, they have the prospect of definitely less in deflationary commodities, possibly going inflationary, especially for those that are overexposed to dairy. Yep. Um, so thinking about how operators and 
and restaurant owners can keep that profitability constant without yeah. taking too much price, it's going to be a difficult dynamic. So I think labor pressures will continue to be a problem. And you see people implementing technology. So kind McDonald's isn't just doing technology for fun. They're yeah, doing yeah. it to yeah. speed up the back of the house as well as to save on labor to some extent. Um, so I think that will uh, continue to be a factor as companies progress. Gotcha. So turning to Starbucks, you talked about this a bit during the presentation, Howard Schultz being on the call, saying, yeah. saying a lot on, on the call for somebody who's not the CEO anymore. Is that a red flag going forward? I think, I think he just has a little bit of nostalgia maybe. I yeah. think if, it's, if it becomes a trend, then we have to kind of walk that line a little bit and reevaluate. But I think, yeah. I think he just stepped down at the beginning of April officially, right? Yeah. Um, so. It, it was weird to have him chiming in and have Kevin, like, Howard, do you have anything to say? Um, <laughs> Defer to him for questions. But uh, yeah, so I think that, that probably needs to stop longer yeah. term. I think that's probably just evident that Kevin may not be totally ready to be yeah. a complete CEO yeah. right now. Uh, we haven't lost face in him completely yet. Though. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, is the new tech initiative at, at McDonald's meant to speak to millennials? Solely millennials? Yeah, I think so, but I think Technology speaks to more than just millennials. Yeah. I think, I think the older—I don't want to say older generation because we're millennials here—but I think people are interested in using technology, yeah. and I think it it allows you to not feel rushed in the restaurant. You get to customize your order. Yeah. You know exactly what you're going to get because you look at the menu. You look at your receipt before you push submit, mm -hmm. and I think it's just a different experience of not. You know that moment like when you're, if you're using cash, which no one really uses anymore, yeah. and like they hand you back the change and like you're rushing to get it in so you're not holding up the person yeah, behind you? I think technology will kind of alleviate that stress to some extent. No, it's little people. things to it. It takes away the little things yeah. that are like kind of hiccups. Yeah. Um, what are the biggest risks to our long thesis on McDonald's? I think, I think changing consumer perception, yep. using this technology and going with fresh beef on at least a quarter pounder for now, mm -hmm are critical components to them kind of regaining trust in a new generation that yeah. will go to them. And if that doesn't work well, I think it could cause issues, but I think all signs point that they're doing the right things now to please the millennial consumer. Perfect, great. That is all we have in the queue. Sector Spotlight is done for today. Thanks for joining us, have a great day.